Hey everyone, my name is Mike Vaughn. I'm a writer for Geek Vibes Nation, and I'm also the author of The Ultimate Guide to Strange Cinema. And I'm Dylan Gonzalez. I'm the editorial director for GeekVibesNation.com and also a co-host of the Home Dance Film Festival podcast. And welcome to a new Video Attic new release roundup. Um, as always, we have a lot of fantastic titles to talk about, but I'm going to uh, kick it off to you to get this uh, party started. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I, my first title is like one of like my most anticipated of the year. Um, it was one of my favorite movies of last year, and that is new Criterion Collection release of The Power of the Dog, uh, which I have to admit, uh, a lot of times I don't exactly see eye to eye on like a lot of like critical darlings. Like I usually appreciate them more, more than I love them. Like Roma, I think is great, but like I wasn't rapturous like it, uh whenever it came out mm -hmm. but for power of the dog i think the hype for me uh it really worked and like it i think it's an amazing movie <laughs> um and people might know it as uh the movie that almost won best picture this last year um i was still happy with the outcome but i think both of these movies were uh fantastic but um here's the disc art for the 4k disc uh and I put that on the bottom so it doesn't have a chance of getting scratched. Um, and here, um, so I will I will keep talking about the movie in a second. But yeah, that's the interior, and then it also comes with this uh, fold out uh, like little pamphlet where you have an essay from Amy Tobin here, it, and it just kind of unfurls from there. So you got all kinds of good information that gives like some great uh analysis of the movie and the themes and all that good stuff so yes uh so power of the dog for uh those who haven't watched it yet uh it's a really great movie um it deals with um benedict cumberbatch who plays uh this uh kind of like it's sexually repressed uh, rancher. He's like kind of suppressing his homosexuality. Um, and he, with, he runs a ranch with his brother played by Jesse Plemons, who has just met uh, this uh, single mother played by Kirsten Dunst, um, who her son is played by Cody Smith McPhee. And this kind of this quartet of actors, they really, it's really their, um, their interactions with one another and how Phil played by Benedict Cumberbatch has kind of, Rep repressed sexuality kind of manifest toxicity within the family and how that ultimately resolves um like how he kind of uh burdens like the family and especially the cody smith mcphee character the younger son um how uh his presence impacts him and how vice like conversely how this the younger boys uh, presence impacts Phil so it's kind of like a interesting slow burn but it's not too slow like a lot of people a lot, a lot of movies like this I think people are afraid of them being like too artsy or slow or whatever this is a really like well-paced like energetic but like uh like thoughtful movie and I think the, the performances are some of the best that I saw all of last year um, the cinematography is amazing. The direction from Jane Campion, which she won Best Director for, is just perfect. I love it so much. This movie is just firing on all cylinders for me, and it's just it gets better every time I watch it. It's just so, so good. And I think Jane Campion, she doesn't make a movie super often, but whenever she does make a movie, it's something you want to pay attention to. Uh, I know the Criterion Collection released uh, The Piano earlier this year, uh, which was one of her earliest films on 4k um and that's also a really great release but this is her newest and this release it's really great um the, it comes in uh dolby vision and it has dolby atmos audio uh and also on the blu-ray there's dolby atmos audio as well so that both formats you do have the dolby atmos audio it looks fantastic which the center cinematography from ari wegman is just so good like so sumptuous and like these western expanses and just like their her use of shadow is amazing the dolby atmos sounds great and there's a lot of really great special features like uh carry over some special features that were on netflix like there's a piece with uh uh jane campion that runs about uh 
18 minutes, which is on Netflix. But from the from what I can tell, most of these other featurettes are kind of exclusive to this disc. Um, there is another kind of uh, more broad ranging and uh, like overlook of the movie that's like 28 minutes. There's a uh, 24 minute conversation with like all the uh, women in the film. So like Jane Campion, Kirsten Dunst, uh, cinematography art, cinematographer Ari Wegman and um, one of the producers, they kind of come together in like a little panel discussion, which is really great. Um, there's a 14 minute piece on the score. And then there's a 13 minute um, new featurette uh, with Annie. I think it's Annie Prue is how you uh, pronounce it. She is the writer of the original Brokeback Mountain story. Um, and she kind of tells the story of how this, this novel, Power of the Dog, which is, is like adapted from, was kind of very unknown in, in its time and how it's kind of overlooked and kind of its journey to being rediscovered and now eventually being turned into this movie and then how it like boosted that writer's legacy because a lot of his actual um, experiences are in The Power of the Dog. Like um, He had like an abusive figure in his life as well and just uh, all that type of information. So if you're a fan of this movie, like I am, I'm so glad Criterion like I'm glad that they pick up these Netflix releases because even though you know like Netflix is omnipresent and like everyone has Netflix it's getting pretty expensive now and like a lot of people I mean they're cutting cords and I don't want to have to like rely on Netflix to know that I can see this movie and like I don't have the compression issues I have like just a very awesome disc that like I can depend on it'll always be there for me so uh I appreciate Criterion uh, kind of Get, getting this on disc so power of the dog one of my favorite things that i've watched recently it's highly recommended it is doggone good <laughs> exactly um, well yeah your dog was chiming in while we were you were and so he was like he... i'm powerful i'm powerful and i'm like <laughs> not you not you um but no yeah i i, I completely agree it's a fantastic movie um we watched it um I guess shortly after it came out on Netflix and mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's pretty great. I, I know we can't really talk about the ending, but that ending just to say it was so impactful. It was so like, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a good ending. It's I, yeah, I, I feel like the movie's great, but it truly does build to that. Like, finale it's mm -hmm. great um so speaking of prestige films mm -hmm. um really good films excellent films even i am finishing out these this massive beast of a collection um i know you did a fantastic unboxing video but i'm just gonna do a vanna white and just show this beauty off here but I will link your unboxing video in the description because it is really excellent as always. Thank you. It doesn't hurt to show this package off and like even more because it's amazing. <laughs> oh yeah, it's like, I wasn't really sure what the hype was all about. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, duh, this is fantastic. So um, I'm gonna be talking about four, the last four um, films. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly. They're so iconic. They've been seen a hundred million times, but I still want to talk about them mm -hmm. um, because they're great. And I really appreciate um, getting a chance to see and review these. So um, first we're going to start with It Happened One Night. And wow. I mean, talk about a fantastic film. So let me just show this off here. We have the vintage uh, poster art. And then the features. I believe none of these are reversible, but we'll just take a look anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, which, I mean, I don't mind that they're not, like, it's not reversible art, artwork. I mean, I think that that's really mm -hmm. solid. Uh, and as you can see, this was a best picture winner. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah it is uh it's such a classic i don't i mean it's one of those movies that um now film scholars please don't come after me <laughs> but um if i'm understanding this correctly this this 
um, didn't really uh, kick off the screwball comedy, but I think that it really like brought it to the forefront and made it really popular. Um, and um, yeah, so it, it's one of those like wacky, like misunderstanding sort of like if only they would communicate with each other, they would actually figure out kind of what's going on. But of course, what's what's the fun in that? And that's what's what's uh, great about a lot of these like uh, screwball comedies. Like, so this is um, Frank Capra. Of course, everybody knows him from It's a Wonderful Life. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which I believe was in volume one. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I love Frank Capra. I am really excited that this is um, a part of this collection. And really, I mean, this is another movie that, as you said, is like firing on all cylinders. Its direction is wonderful. It's witty. It's charming. Like the like the pacing in these older movies is nuts. I mean, you know, you you watch a lot of these old movies. It just clips along like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can really see that like stuff like uh, Lubitsch and Howard Hawks really took a page from this movie with like the witty dialogue. Um, oh my gosh, Clark Gable, um, Claudette Colbert. I mean, talk about a fantastic match. And it's just beautifully endearing. Like there's um, a lot of like great chemistry between these two actors. And yeah, I don't want to spoil too much because it, it is such a fun twisting turn kind of like shenanigans screwball comedy i love stuff like that mm -hmm. like the the scene where like they're like sharing a bedroom it's a little scandalous but it's such a cute sort of charming endearing scene it's interesting to think that something that innocent could be maybe even a little bit racy back in the 30s but yeah it's it's a really good one and i i i have to say that all of these transfers look really impressive like i had seen this before now i had never owned this one in any other format but like i've seen it a ton on tcm and i love tcm but sometimes the prints that they source aren't maybe great so yeah seeing this in 4k seeing this like beautiful contrast between the black and white and like so much of the details really pop again, like the sets and the production design. Um, there's a lot of like scenes at night. So you really get to see like that depth and like what's going on and everything. So yeah, fantastic. Um, and um, it does have some nice um, features. I believe these were all ported over um, for previous releases. And um, it really does give you a lot of context behind this movie and just kind of like what its place was in terms of like shaping the screwball comedy and then just pretty much comedy in, in general, really, like mm -hmm. the proto rom-coms. Um, they take a lot of pages from this and you can kind of see that. So that's really awesome. Now, here's one that shame on me i had never seen before <laughs> and this kind of sounds like a bond movie uh to serve with love oh, yeah. <laughs> i mean doesn't it though yeah and there's the back and then we're gonna just take its clothes off here and oh <laughs> oh my <laughs> um so here's the here's the back and again uh they do not just plop these out they really do put a lot of love and attention into these um i don't know how you feel about this but i love um teacher movies where it's like um you go to like some it's usually like inner city kids mm -hmm. and uh there's a teacher that's like gonna make a difference and he's gonna like shape these young minds and like um Gosh, my favorite is Blackboard Jungle, but I, I'm I'm going yeah. off on a tangent. But anyways, um, I love kind of movies like this. So it was really interesting to see like how this played with a British working class uh, of kids. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting to see that kind of perspective. And Sidney Portier, I mean, it should go without saying that he gives a hundred million percent um 
all the time. Mm -hmm. And he was fantastic um, as the, the teacher. And again, so this is a fairly by the numbers film. If you've seen these like films, sort of like Blackboard Jungle or Dangerous Minds, it really doesn't stick too far from that um, formula. But the acting is so great. The kids are so engaging. Um, it, it's it's like I said, it's so interesting when, you know, there was this British new wave of like films of like really exploring working class British people. So I've been delving a lot into those films on um, the Criterion channel. So to, to see this in this sort of like lens, it was really fascinating to me. And um you know, they call them the angry young men films in Britain, um, which I always think is like a really interesting sort of subgenre. Um, I will say there is a little subplot that really doesn't go anywhere, I guess, but I believe it's Judy Geeson's character kind of has a huge crush on Sidney Portier's, uh, I think his name is uh, Thackeray, um, and um, it's really innocent, but it still was kind of creepy. Um, they never, it's never overtly sexual, but it's a little bit still because she's in high school and that's her teacher. I mean, nothing inappropriate happens, but yeah, it's still a little little weird. But anyways, it, it kind of doesn't go anywhere, but it really is such an interesting um, film. It really does show you what a blackboard jungle would look like maybe in like a british context and honestly it never got as like dark or as, as impactful as say blackboard jungle which they dealt with like heavy subject matter like um sexual assault and um like uh the um oh gosh i can't think of the main guy is that uh, John Ford? Who directed it? Who, um, the star, was it Glenn Ford? I haven't um, seen that, sorry. Um, well, anyways, like his wife has a miscarriage because of like the kids. Yeah, it was Glenn Ford, okay. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, it never gets that heavy. So it does, it does really feel like it plays very light and loose with the subject matter, but it is... A really great movie like it kind of ends how you think it would but it's one of those like okay it's predictable but it's so satisfying like the way that these kids actually could be sort of turned around and it just gives you a lot of hope for the future that's nice <laughs> yeah um no i mean it, it's i'm I was being a little sarcastic, but it, I really did like it. So my next one is another one that I had always wanted to see, but just never had. And that is From Here to Eternity. And that is, of course, the f uh, famous beach scene. And uh, this is also a Best Picture winner. And here we go. And we got a stacked cast there. It's it's kind of wild to see uh, Deborah Carr is like sexy. And oh, I know yeah. that sounds so mean because, you know, she always is sort of like the prim, proper, um, like person in a lot of her most famous roles, like The King and I and The Innocents. She's always like this very matronly, um, you know, non-offensive, a uh, very um, prim and proper person, but yeah, here she's like she's got it going on. I like that. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, again, this is something that I slept on for a while, but it's one of those um, movies that it, it really just blew me away when I saw it. Um, Fred Zimmerman directs a sweeping epic about World War II. Um, men on an army base uh, in Hawaii, 1941. And uh, the scale and the scope of this drama is really a sight to behold. And I think that um, it's really interesting to think about like 10 years later, a movie like this probably wouldn't have gotten made because of the counterculture of 
you know, getting into the 60s. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, everything, again, is just fantastic. The details and the costumes, the set, the production design, uh, it's a compelling, like, love triangle. Like, I'm not, I know people will hate me for this. I'm not a big Frank Sinatra fan of movies, but he's really great in this. Um, I mean, your mileage may vary, but like when he's not in that Rat Pack role where he's like hitting on everything that has a pulse. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like, uh, you know, I want to say something positive about him. So he's good in this. Every, everybody's great in this. But um, yeah, it's really fantastic. Um, I had no idea Ernest Borgnai was in this in a supporting role. Love Ernest Borgnai. He's like the goat, in my opinion. So great movie. Uh, again, also looks excellent. Um, I, I really had no problems with any of these transfers. Like they were across the board, just stunning. My last film is one that I kind of didn't really want to see, if I'm being honest, but it's it wasn't that bad. Um, and that's Annie. I mean, didn't want didn't want to see the little orphan Annie just singing her heart out and just I mean, trying to long happens. for better days. I have some nice things to say about it. It really was was good. Um, I'm not a Grinch, I promise. Um, I know. Wow. That's such a Grinch thing to say. <laughs> Only a Grinch would say that. <laughs> uh, okay, so here's the back. So, yeah, okay. Um, I know this movie probably best for um, the clip in um, Serial Mom. Oh, yeah. um but yeah um even though i wasn't really excited for this i did uh, end up really liking it um and this is kind of like what i like about this set is it does seem a little random but like i like how it kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone a little bit so um yes the movie is very sweet it's very saccharine it's very if you don't like musicals, I don't know if this would necessarily change your mind. It, it, it's very aggressively a musical. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Like, if you're in that, like, mood for that, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because it was actually, I uh, after watching it, I looked it up and it was a critical bomb. But mm -hmm. over the years, it's kind of being reclaimed as uh, a classic. And uh, yeah, I don't know how faithful it is to the play, but I loved it. Like, I love Carol Burnett in it. Tim Curry's in it. I did not did not know that. See, now, if you would have told me Tim Curry was in this, I probably would have, like, went out and watched it sooner. Um, yeah, you would have had to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like, it's sort of like uh, when you're gay, you have to, you're contractually obligated to see everything Tim Curry made. Um <laughs> Yeah, yeah, again, does it need to be two hours long? Probably not. Some of the musical numbers are a little bit better than others, but I was engaged. I was not bored. This cast is fantastic. I mean, um, the little girl playing Annie's great. Carol Burnett is a legend, an icon. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, overall, this set is fantastic now these aren't all of these obviously there was other the other two that i covered uh last episode um so definitely check that out but uh yeah gosh i have to say that i mean this is on sale right now on amazon for a little over 100 bucks but you really do get quite a bang for your buck here so um again um i will link your uh terrific unboxing video that everybody should check out because uh you know you did a really fantastic cool. job on that and uh yeah this is a really good set i i really am a believer in these columbia sets now like yeah gotta keep them coming <laughs> yeah and it's, it's less than 20 dollars per title so just like yeah. keep like keep it going uh my next title is following up my uh my dog theme with power of the dog um i'm going with paramount's pause of fury the legend of hank oh yes so, so keeping the the dog theme um 
So this was one that it was kind of on my radar, but I didn't have the highest hopes for it just because a lot of like <laughs> non Disney and like even Illumination movies are kind of iffy because I yeah. I mean except, except for like Ardman and stuff, but that's like a whole different ball game of like claymation and like stop motion and stuff. But just regular good old fashioned CGI animation. <laughs> Uh, but overall, it's a cute movie. I enjoyed it. It, it. How it's how it was kind of presented, uh, like how it originated, was like, what if Blazing Saddles, but animated and for kids? Um, mm. Yeah, but they cut. They do. I think they kind of eventually kind of got away from that a little bit. It's not like a one for one, but it's it's kind of close. Um, the basic premise of this is there's a that that there's a town of like uh cats who are like pretty much like they hate dogs and they like they're basically none to be found but there is this dog named hank right here who is uh set to be executed but uh uh these cats they are kind of put in a position where they need uh protection they need like a samurai to come in and protect them from like this evil like outside entity and they begrudgingly put Hank in this role and he like trying to, to uh, become like a samurai master that he's like always dreamt of this. So he's like going to train under this master samurai cat who's kind of like washed up and like has some of his own baggage. Um, so it's like a little bit of Kung Fu Panda mixed with Blazing Saddles where it's like everyone is just like very wary of this outsider this instead of an african-american man it's a dog and a cat community um and how this dog's journey to becoming like a hero to the community and like kind of trying to avoid the uh kind of pitfalls of like some of his like sudden ascendance to fame and all that type of mixture of stuff and there there's some like really dumb jokes in this i will admit that like this is a kid's movie so there's going to be like some like kind of low-hanging fruit that they tackle but there's also a lot of really clever jokes in this that i did really appreciate it for like uh cinephiles like us there's like a lot of allusions to like classic like kung fu movies and like classic comedies like the mel brooks plays a voice in this movie which is fun um and this also has a really good uh voice cast uh, michael Sarah plays hank um this also has uh, Michelle Yeoh plays a role, um, George Takai, uh, Ricky Gervais, uh, Gabriel Iglesias, and Samuel Jackson plays kind of the mentor who's teaching him like how to like uh, basically come into his like martial arts training. And so, yeah, this isn't like high art or anything, but for kind of like a light Blazing Saddles remake for kids, it's pretty amusing it's like a passable time that i like i don't think you'll be majorly disappointed by i don't think you'll be like blown away but it's like solid um the it, the presentation was surprisingly good like for these types of family films i don't expect a lot from like the like audio side of things because usually it's just like a standard 5.1 they included a dolby atmos audio track on this which is pretty cool like for a family film that it's like a really complex sound design that I really enjoyed. It looks really nice. It's like crisp CGI animation. Um, the colors are really nice. And they also have like a, a couple of nice featurettes. There's like uh, basically like a featurette of them just kind of doing like a broad overview of the movie and the characters and like um, some of the voice actors. But then there's also a featurette where it's like one of those like how to draw featurettes where they kind of take you through some of the uh, characters in the film. But, but that runs almost 20 minutes so it's pretty detailed which is it's fun for people who are like are interested in like kind of like the, how animation evolves and characters design stuff so if you're in for like if you have seen all like the uh pixar and big like big animation titles for this year this one's not bad it's like i said it's it's decent so pause the fury the legend of hank it's uh, it's amusing enough for adults i think to have a light recommendation. <laughs> yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, I had it on mute because sometimes I, I'm not sure if I'm sipping loudly, so. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, there he goes again with that sipping. 
Mm. I was like, oh no, my internet like messed up. Uh, no sound. Um, but I will keep the animation train going here with um, Batman and Superman Battle of the Super Sons. And uh, I love this cover. It's really, yeah. um, really nice looking. Yeah. DC are, always does a really good job with their artwork of enticing you. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Here's um, another shot of the back and no reversible art. Um, this does have a digital code that is not in there, but yours will have it. Um, so that's the inside. So, um, yeah, I think right off the bat, I think it's interesting to mention that if you are not really into the lore of Batman and Superman and their like offspring and all this like you know what multiverse or timeline they're talking about if that stuff is keeping you from watching this don't it does really give you a story that you don't necessarily need to have all that like knowledge and lore it really does a, a nice job of explaining things to you um but I will say that it does reward fans with easter eggs and little winks and nods to to other comics and and properties and stuff um this has one of the things that i've been wanting to see in a batman movie so badly and that is the fact that batman has a dinosaur in the bat cave <laughs> okay and that's listen that's a fact that's a fact of life it's it's just science um, <laughs> um but i mean but all jokes aside that was really cool but but you know, I mentioned that because one, I was really excited, but two, that's a level of detail that I, I kind of love from these like Batman animated films. And um, yeah, the animation is fantastic. Um, the story is really engaging. There's a lot of nice humor. There is a good message um, that's wrapped in here, but I, it does a nice balancing job where the message isn't so hammered home that it feels like in service of the story. Mm -hmm. Like it tells a really nice um, A to B to C uh, plot with, um, you know, Batman's son and Superman's son needing to team up to defeat Starro, which, you know, um, which was a character prior to the Suicide Squad. Yeah. Um, but just was, is a little bit more famous now because of it. But anyways, um, it was fun to see Starro again. Um, so yeah, um, again, it's it's a really fun time. It's not very long. It's, gosh, maybe what, 80 minutes? Um, like these features are never super long. And I mean, that's kind of, that's just under 80 minutes. So that's nice because if you're like younger and don't have a big the attention span or if you're like somebody like me as like an adult that doesn't also have a, a huge attention span at sometimes yeah. uh <laughs> um you know this is the movie for you and again it's great it has a good message about getting along about working together about being stronger and i kind of lo love how like like superman's son is gradually leveling up his powers Mm -hmm. which I think is really folded in nicely to the plot where it's like, oh, okay, I can do this now. Okay, I can do this now. And it, it's it's nice the way they, they just sort of gradually, um, like everything sort of kicks in, which kind of seems like, I mean, this isn't realistic, obviously, but it kind of seems like something that would, would be a realistic thing. So yeah, it's great. Um, it's probably one of my favorite DCAU movies uh, this year. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one. That's one, especially since it's like I, I'm I'm not Batman Superman out, but it's good to get a different perspective on yeah. like that kind of dynamic with like the younger generation to see it's just something different for DC fans because uh, variety is the spice of life. <laughs> Yeah, like between this and the DC Super Pets, it's like a nice different lens on an outside looking into the, the core hero. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, my next title is another brand new film from Lionsgate, and that is Dig with uh, Thomas Jane and Emil Hirsch uh, and Liana Liberato and uh, Harlow Jane, which is Thomas Jane's daughter, playing his mm. daughter in the film. So that's a, a fun bit of casting. Um, so this just a standard in, interior Blu-ray. There is a digital copy copy that comes with this that is not inside of here. Um, so this film is fine. It's not the <laughs> best. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, I kind of knew what I was getting into. I knew it was kind of, it wasn't directly direct to video, but it's very much that type of film. And so, what drew me to this is I, I I am a Thomas Jane fan. I think he usually does a pretty good job. And I used to be like a like a pretty decent Emil Hirsch fan. And then he kind of did some crazy stuff like about a decade ago and kind of like got quietly canceled. And then he's like kind of back like he's kind of abusive to like a publicist or something. It was weird, but um, he's he's still he's still kicking around in these type of movies. Uh, but this film, it's it's not anything that you've never like. It's not anything new, I guess. Um, you've seen this type of film before. Thomas Jane. Um, the story starts out. He uh, he is uh, out one night with his wife, trying to track down their daughter who's at a party. And then after kind of like forcefully taking out her out from the party, um, they get into an altercation later on the road, which results in his wife's death and his daughter losing her hearing. Um, and this is pr pretty much all uh, uh, as a result of his character's anger issues and just kind of like not being able to control his impulse control. Um, and then you kind of fast forward a year and him and his daughter are at, are at odds end. Um, she, he is trying to like possibly, it, it, in an interesting um, uh, parallel to Sound of Metal, he is possibly trying to like raise enough money to get her a procedure that could possibly help her hearing. Um, and he's kind of, he's lightly learning how to do sign language, but uh, he's not, he's kind of like distant from his daughter and she's kind of isolated a little bit. All this to, is uh, like a separate thing from uh, Emil Hirsch plays this kind of, uh, they'll just call him a gangster. He's, he's kind of like a ne'er-do-well who hires uh, Thomas Jane's character who plays kind of like a, kind of a person who like uh, uh, scraps metal and like uh, like basically uh, strips houses of like all, all their like interiors and stuff and like salvages it. So he hires at him to do that in a trailer, but the one, um, uh, one thing that they are tasked to not do is like don't, break into any of like don't hit any of the walls don't mess with any of the walls which of course they end up doing and they learn that he is like a like a kind of like a drug smuggler um i know this is a long-winded explanation uh basically they end up getting uh taken hostage by these uh criminals like emil hirsch and his girlfriend and they are asked to start digging a hole because there is something buried on the property that they want to uh get gain access to so it's basically like a cat and mouse drama throughout of like uh this man and his daughter are taking hostage while they are also kind of like they have like unresolved issues between themselves and then they're also trying to survive this like crazy night or a couple days with these criminals who are mo more than likely going to kill them at the end of things so it's just like a cat and mouse dynamic uh it plays out pretty much how you would expect there's not really any twist and turns the most interesting ab thing about this is emil hirsch's character is just well both him and the his the woman who plays his girlfriend they're batshit insane and they are they like i, I can't he emil hirsch isn't playing like a uh uh like not a white gangster necessarily like a like a like a thug like a um but he's playing very boisterous and like very over the top and like he's a type of guy who like one example i like to try to underline my point of just like their insanity is like 
he learns something about his girlfriend being like duplicitous and basically screwing over and then screwing him over but he freaking loves it because he's like you would screw me over and like try to like take all this money for yourself like i freaking love you for that you're amazing i love that my girl is so <laughs> cunning and stuff like that type of like weird energy is that's what we're working with the whole time just like you never know what these kind of criminals are going to be doing you just know that they kind of have a desire to kill people and that they want to just like create chaos so that's kind of fun but just the execution as a whole is just nothing you like new to the genre it's it's fine it's not terrible but it's just like once i finished it i kind of forgot about it almost like not completely i, I remember it obviously but it's just kind of like i'm not going to think about it again now that i've watched it and i probably won't return to it but it was like fine while i was watching it it's just kind of forgettable drama so this does come with an audio commentary and mm -hmm. which like is always nice for at least some effort is put into this and it looks fine it's a brand new movie like it looks good sounds good um so if you're into like this type of like kind of forgettable lionsgate fair which they just they put out a lot of good stuff but then they also put out a lot of like lower grade movies so uh this is another one <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um that one might be maybe a rental down the road um yeah my my next one is one that i was really excited for because i had seen it once before and really liked it but i'd never like owned it so now it was like great going back to this um that is escape from alcatraz um from kino studio classics and take a look at that and slip cover and y'all know if you want that you want to like get it very quickly so um there's a better look at the features um no reversible art um this does come well as the cover says it has a 4k and a blu-ray um that's not always the case so i like to just point that out again um but anyways yeah so um this is a good one. Have you seen this one? Not yet. I'm really excited though. Like they've been putting out a lot of great Clint Eastwood stuff in 4K. So I'm yeah. interested to get to this one. Um, so this wasn't directed by Eastwood. This was directed by Don Siegel. And it's maybe one of my favorite from that director. Um, excuse the pun, but this is a take no prisoner action film. Um, it. I will it, not excuse your pun. <laughs> that's fair that's fair you're being arrested for that <laughs> for, well don't please don't punish me uh i'm out of here I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> that's our show good night <laughs> um but no it, it's it, it's so fascinating because yes it does tell um whether or not it's i mean it feels super accurate to the actual like escape from alcatraz like the title um <laughs> but it also works kind of as like a nice like prison like men in prison film or like a really gritty sort of like snapshot into like daily life for prisoners and it, it's interesting because going back to this and then not too long ago watching Shawshank um you can kind of see how I mean I'm not saying like one copy the other I mean this was this was first from the 70s but um 1979 but anyways like you can definitely see how like the um, men's prison genre kind of evolved and um, it's not very tropey. Like there are some things that like you will always kind of see with these movies, especially like the later movies, which is like stuff that just kind of rubs me the wrong way. Like there's stuff where, you know, Eastwood is, is of course this big macho guy. That's who he always plays. And, you know, he gets, um confronted in the shower um and it's really awkward and of course clean eastwood like beats the crap out of the guy but it's like stuff like that always just feels reductive and kind of gross but uh thankfully it's not like that's not a lot of the movie a lot of it is just showing um these like individual characters they do give these characters like moments to breathe they do give like eastwood like 
um a little bit of a softer touch like he adopts this pet rat um that he like kind of feeds and takes care of i mean the movie is like just um it's not quite two hours long but it it feels epic in the sense that they give you a really clear idea of like who all these men are and then they kind of work in how they methodically uh you know you know craft their escape so it's a movie in, in two kind of like interesting uh things going on like i said it's like their daily life and also like how they work together to do this epic escape and i won't spoil the finale but i do kind of like how um they don't really give you a lot of easy answers i'll just say okay um as far as how it looks i was really um impressed because um so this is another one that um no it's not uh i thought maybe it was something i, I thought it was one that the um maybe like the dp like supervised or somebody but um it does really look fantastic um it's not the most visually uh stunning movie i mean it's like in a prison <laughs> you know it's very like gray and gross and stuff looking but like um especially like like the darker lit scenes you can really see that um there's like an uptick in the brightness um like the skin tones look really nice and natural and clean. There's really no um, artifacts or like even the grains like non-existent here. It's really, really like Kino is always kind of top of their game and their 4K is just like uh, fantastic. Um, like I had seen this uh, again. I've seen this on cable where the print wasn't necessarily good. So watching it in 4K, I was like, wow, this I mean, the the color um, really just has a nice contrast. It's not oversaturated, but it's there was a little bit of like where like images look a little bit soft. But honestly, if I wasn't like acutely looking for it, I probably wouldn't have noticed it's, it doesn't like de detract in any way. But uh, overall, just really nice looking and sounds great, too. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that one. That's high on my list to watch. Um, my next title is one from NBD Entertainment and Giant Pictures, and that is I Declare War. Mm. And this is a movie from about a decade ago. I think it was 2012 or 2013. Um, and so this is basically like a game of uh, it's like what like capture the flag for these these young kids but heightened to like um with like magical realism so it's like these kids in the woods they're playing a game of capture the flag but in their minds what they are living are like they like instead of like the sticks that they have they have like actual guns that they're carrying around and stuff so you are seeing this through their eyes where like they're like headshots and stuff but like these kids aren't getting killed it's like not gratuitous necessarily but it's like it's like visualizing this game of capture the flag in the most like intense terms possible so you'll have like um kids carrying around like bazookas and like just like hitting like shooting each other like point blank with guns and stuff and um but this is all framed in like kind of it's based in character. Like you get to know these kids and their character dynamics and they're like uh, different, like the two opposing sides, they have uh, their own like history with one another. And like certain people are like holding the other side's people, uh, cat, like holding them like hostage for leverage to try to like gain certain advantages over the other side. So there's like, interesting young adult character drama within this and this is mostly like young uh, young boys but there is also one of my favorite characters is this young girl who uh joins in like her journey with these like within this group of like how like why she is joining like what she hopes to gain out, out of it and like how she uses her presence as a girl in this like group of boys like how the boys expect her to use this advantage, how she actually uses it, what her kind of like entire journey is, is really fascinating to me. And also like 
there's like with these young like young kids there's also the, all these heightened emotions and like there's this feeling of like isolation and loneliness so you do have certain characters who are like i am just doing this because like i don't know how to make friends and i've always wanted to make friends and it's like very sad but they're like i just want to like i want to be a part of this so i can hopefully make friends and then like seeing how they are treated uh, like while they're trying to make friends and stuff can like be interesting or heartbreaking depending on the situation and I don't know, it's just a really like i i've kind of seen this compared to like a stand by me type uh like film which it is it's like coming of age but it's like within the context of this heightened game of capture the flag and it's really good i really enjoyed it um i think this won like an audience award when it premiered at toronto like 12 years ago like i said um but uh, this is a really good film. Um, there's not really any special features on this. There's like a trailer, but the transfer is good. And I don't think this is the type of film you really find very easily on streaming. But so um, I do recommend seek, like seeking it out. It's a really like really good coming of age film and like some interesting action and character dynamics. So I declare war. It's a good movie. Hmm. No, that sounded yeah. That sounds really interesting. Um, so like in the imaginary world is it super graphic or is it like just kind of uh it's not anything too terrible like there like there are like like i said there are headshots but you don't see like insane amounts of blood it's not like tarantino s blood but you'll right. you'll hear like a, a very visceral gunshot and they'll like fall down as if they've been like shot but then they're like within the, they establish the rules up top. Like if you get shot, you have this many seconds that you have to stay stunned. And like, there's all these rules to the game that they, they still stick to that. Like, but, um, and then like people are only dead if you get like tossed like this, like basically a water balloon full of like fake food coloring, like blood, like that's how you actually die. Like, mm. but the most visceral scenes in the movie are actually, whenever like real rocks are being thrown which it just like freaks me out which was also mm -hmm. my most terrifying moment of it chapter one for me is whenever the bullet like the bullies were throwing rocks or whatever or they were throwing rocks at the bullets one one or the other and i was just like "Ooh, this is way scarier than any clown it's just being <laughs> pummeled by rocks so it's kind of like that it's very uh i think it might be pg-13 uh, it's actually not rated interestingly but it's I think it would be fine for like a like a teenage young adult audience. Yeah, that sounds uh, pretty interesting. Um, so my next couple of titles are um, documentaries, and you know we always love to mix it up a little bit here. We like to get uh, get our culture on, um, yeah, of course. So, um, and I have to say there, I know I say this a lot, but there's always like one or two titles a week that I'm like. Man, I as much as I love everything we cover, like I get really excited about because it's like stuff that I don't think people um, maybe uh, hear enough about. And so that's actually what I'm going to be talking about, which is called Buried. And it is the 1982 Alpine uh, Meadows Avalanche. So um, there's the cover in the back. Um, and then this is from Kino and, and Greenwich. Um, village so um yeah it's um really fascinating i had never heard of this before um it, it tells the harrowing story about i believe it's the third deadliest avalanche mm -hmm. and um so the filmmakers do a really good job of kind of laying out like so i know nothing about avalanches i know certainly nothing about controlled avalanches which um that in and of itself is kind of fascinating um i kind of could have watched a whole thing about that but um yeah so this talks about how they were doing controlled um avalanches and they do a really good job of bringing all of the survivors everybody that was there to like give you um a good sense of like the people that were there the time the culture um what exactly they were doing and then the, the chain of events that kind of led to this horrific tragedy um and it does a really good job of 
yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of um, interesting and fascinating, but it's also like tragic, but then they bring it around to hopeful and they, they focus on, of course, the victims, but then they also sort of coda the film with um, the one uh, survivor who, well, she wasn't the sole survivor, but she was like, she was a survivor that like, they kind of thought like it was a small miracle she survived so it kind of puts uh, a nice sort of spin on it um without also diluting the fact that this was a tragedy um but it 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 is really fascinating and um it's one of those movies that it's it's you know a little over an hour and a half but it kind of goes by quickly because again you're like taking in all this really interesting information and um the people that are being interviewed are are really engaging but um yeah this this one was really i liked it i think it was maybe one of my favorite documentaries this year so far oh, like that's i was really promising yeah i was really glued i i i thought that again they 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 laid everything out nicely they um you know I know there was a documentary you were talking about that that you were saying it just wasn't like laid out right or it just felt really paced weird. I can't remember what it was, but um anyways, this doesn't have that problem. It's it's right. um easy, yeah, it's easy to understand. It's great. Again, I I could have just watched a whole thing about them blowing up intentional pieces of the of the you know mountain to you know which like it sounds wild but i guess that's safer than just letting nature do its thing but um yeah yeah but uh not always so there is this kind of sense of like nature versus like the hubris of man which is maybe a little cliche but i think it is apt here and that is like a theme that runs throughout the documentary so it's fascinating i really liked it i I think that this should be on your radar. Definitely uh, check it out. Um, like, it's not the most, like, intense, grisly documentary, but I think that it, it's done in as such a respectful and, again, kind of fascinating way. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, my next title is uh, also from MBD, and this is part of their Rewind collection, and this is Ski Patrol, which I believe came out in 1990, and um, unlike a couple uh, Rewind collection titles I've been talking about, I believe this is actually a Blu-ray debut, uh, mm. so this is a first time for this on Blu-ray, unless my research failed me. Uh, um, so, and this has reversible cover art, which I'll show in just a second. Here's the uh, disc art and the here. And it also comes with a poster. Um, and as this, as the cover art at the front says, from the creator of Police Academy. So that kind of gives you a, a sense of the kind of the tone that we're going with with this one. Uh, here is the uh, poster, just a little poster. There we go. Um, so yeah, this is like very much in that vein of like Police Academy, um, a little bit of like Airplane, but not quite as quirky, I would say. Um, it's just kind of like zany uh, antics of like a misfit crew. Um, in, in this case, there's a like a group of like ski instructors or who ski patrol who uh kind of work at this uh lodge and they're like uh um taking care of like people on the mountain and stuff um and everything is pretty much going smoothly until there's a uh a, a, i think it's like a real estate developer or something i'm not exactly sure of his role but he wants to come in and kind of tank everything they're doing kind of like um uh, make them seem like inept and have them basically shut down so he can buy up the property that the mountain is on and like turn it into like resorts or something else like another type of like business for him um and uh no one really can like is aware of his scheming so you just kind of see 
uh, everything's starting to go wrong for them and they don't really know what uh, to do until they uncover the scheme and they band together to fight the forces of evil. Um, so yeah, Martin Mull, he plays the evil real estate developer who I always like him in comedies. Um, the, the cast itself is a mixture of like probably forgotten 80s people and then like some people you would know like uh, now uh, more so known as a writer and director but Paul Feig um, mm. he plays a, a, one of the young instructors um, and the recently um, sadly uh, deceased uh, Leslie Jordan who passed a few mm. weeks ago he plays kind of um, like a kind of like a supervisor type um, amongst the ski instructors um, and then there's also like a bunch of other like a young George Lopez is in this. Um, there's just a ton of like pretty interesting people in here. Um, but overall, it's like a uh, it's not an 80s comedy. Like I said, it's 1990, but it's just coming out of the 80s. So it still kind of has that feel of things. Um, there's uh, some things that don't age as well, but it's not mm -hmm. not too bad for this time period. Honestly, like they could have been a lot worse. Like there's some real wholesome gags because anyone who <laughs> anyone who knows uh, Leslie Jordan, he was a very uh, tiny little man with a like a southern accent, and he was just the best. But in one uh, gag, one of the ski instructors um, gives him a uh, potion um, in order to make him uh, grow because he's a little bit uh, self conscious about his height, and then they. <laughs> they uh in the middle of the night they transport him into like a different household and they make him feel like a giant and that's just the type of fun i'm here for it's it's great um but overall it's it's good hearted it's fun um and this is a good release the transfer was better than i expected to be for like kind of like a forgotten comedy like this it's a really like nice sharp um like natural transfer it looks really nice i didn't see too much in the way of damage sounds pretty nice the only disappointment is there's not really much in the way of uh, special features. There's like a trailer and that's pretty much it. There's like actually like two trailers, but for it and then like other MVD titles. So it would have been nice to get like a commentary or something on this. Uh, I know Paul Feig is probably too busy for this, but like mm -hmm. I, someone in here would have been fun. But overall, it's good to have this on Blu-ray. It's a nice discovery and like MVD, keep up this rewind collection. I, I like I like what you're doing with this. It, so it's a it's a good good time. Would this make a good double feature with this? I, interestingly, <laughs> yes, because there are some. Uh, I did not plan that, but yes, exactly. No, we did plan that. We have this super like, <laughs> but no, that that. Um, it's interesting because there's like a South Park episode where they um go to like a ski lodge, and that yeah. kind of sounds like. I mean, it sounds like what they were we're doing was like a pastiche of those kind of like 80s and uh, as you said it wasn't technically 80s but like yeah. 80s adjacent films um with like the skiing and like the yeah. um so my next title is actually one that um i'm like very familiar with because i actually interviewed the subject of this and that is billy flanagan the happiest man on earth oh yeah and it's the back and i actually also got to reach out to the director who gave me some really nice um quotes for my um review and um he was really sweet to take the time to talk to me a little bit um but uh yeah so this is a really touching documentary that tells the story of now i believe he is the longest uh, contracted Disney performer like he like goes and does um, like the stage shows he'll dress up as various characters and like that's been his job for I think 30 plus years um, so this tells a dual story right it, it, it tells about of course Billy and how he became um, a, a fixture at the you know Disney perform uh, performance kind of um, like there's a there's a whole uh, group of performers and he's kind of like the legend there so it kind of tells like his rise and it's also a really touching story about how you know he was bullied as a kid he um, 
got married, had kids, tried to live a quote unquote normal life. But, you know, he was a, a queer man that eventually came out and started to live his authentic life and how, you know, he was able to like take all of his adversity and really like thrive, uh, which is, I think, a really cool story to uh, have out there. And it also uh, tells how um, during the height of COVID, Billy would bike to his fellow fellow friends and performers and deliver a singing telegram, which started to be known uh, as flanograms. <laughs> So um, it's a really heartwarming, very at times harrowing kind of story. Um, getting to actually talk to Billy was really great because he really is a genuinely nice, great person. You know, you can see his face light up when he talks about things that he loves and enjoys. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's not the most groundbreaking film but I do believe it's something that is worth it's a story worth having out there and I'm glad that he was brave enough to kind of be so vulnerable and and talk about a lot of things that are were probably very painful and uncomfortable to talk about to anybody not like let alone uh to a fa uh, you know film crew so um I got to tell him that I appreciated um him telling his story um like that so yeah it, it's great um it's not all smiles but it, it it's one of those like really great journeys that you really do feel like you know the person after the entire runtime so um yeah unfortunately this doesn't have any extras I mean it would have been nice if they had like maybe some bonus interviews or you know, again, something from the director, but um, yeah, um, this being a newer film, it does look good, especially for DVD. Um, the same with um, Buried. I mean, they, um, you know, use archival footage, which does look rough, but it's like the upconvert to um, DVD actually looks pretty decent overall. So um Maybe they'll eventually put this out on Blu-ray, but I'm just happy that it's uh, we got a, a home video release of this because I do really think that it's a worthwhile um, documentary. Yeah, it sounds like two for two for documentaries for you. <laughs> um, I'm sticking with the Kino Love, this classics, and this is The Valachi Papers uh, with mm -hmm. Charles Bronson, which uh, I've, I've been uh, kind of, uh hit or miss with uh bronson titles i i've uh i haven't been uh checking out every single one that comes on my radar because i know that i just know that not all of his movies are for me but this seemed a little bit different a little bit more interesting and so i decided to give it a shot and i'm glad i did it's a, it's a fun time um this well fun might be the wrong word it's an engaging time it's not exactly mm -hmm. a lighthearted romp or anything um, one of one of the reasons I was uh, uh, eager to check this out is this is from Terrence Young, who did uh, From Russia with Love. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe he did a, a movie called The Young Ones, uh, also from Kino Classics. Um, so I knew he was a solid director, and I was just wanted to see kind of what this was about. So uh, Charles Bronson, this is kind of told in a way where it starts out kind of at the, like uh, the uh, the end near the end of uh, this uh, I think it's Joseph Valachi um, yeah yeah Joe Valachi yeah um, it starts at kind of the end of life he is in prison um, and he kind of gets himself into a situation where he thinks that there's like a, a hit put out on him and then he kind of uh, reflects back on his life and kind of uh, traces his uh, life from kind of like a, um, getting into kind of like the mob game and the mafia. And this really takes you into like the uh, the inner works and workings of the Cosa Nostra and just also all of the, um, like him marrying like a mob boss's daughter and ha having to perform all of these like, uh, well, not having to perform, choosing to perform, but also eventually getting uh, in prison for all these like criminal activities and all that stuff. And then eventually 
uh, turning informant whenever he's kind of forced into a, a corner for like some actions that he uh, undertakes. So this, I believe this is based on a true story. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting one that kind of um, details this man. They don't try to like sugarcoat anything that he was involved in or make him seem like a like a good guy or anything but it it does do a good job of like humanizing him at least and like showing all of like the good and the bad and um just what he had to go th through uh that like in his struggles like he had like struggled where like there were times where he was like so overwhelmed by like being in this type of life that he almost took his own life and just all that type of stuff. It's a really like a solid movie. It's a uh, there's a lot packed in. This is two hours and five minutes, and but it goes by really quickly. It's it's one of those types of movies. I wouldn't say it's like as good as Goodfellas by any means, but it's that type of movie where you get like a well-rounded portrait of like the rise and fall and in between of a, a like a mafia centerpiece. Um, so. And Charles Bronson does a really good job. Um, there's a, a nice like ensemble complimenting him. And uh, yeah, it's just a solid 1970s mafia drama. And if you're into that, the Valachi Papers, it's pretty solid. I believe this was previously re released by uh, Twilight Time. This is being brought back into the fold with Kino Classic. It's not noted as being from a new scan. So if you have that, it's probably a similar quality source wise there's room for improvement it would have been nice to have this remastered but it's it's passable it's it does a fine job there is an audio commentary with a bronson uh, uh expert he's an author on a bronson book named paul talbot mm -hmm. and then there's some like tv and radio spots and all that stuff so it's a good release you, like i said you got this slip cover and it's actually different cover art so mm -hmm. that's pretty cool so get that early if you're interested um so yeah if you're a Charles Bronson fan, you probably already have this on your radar, but I would just say it is a good release. Nice. Yeah, I I do like Bronson, but I, I do completely agree with you. Sometimes it's a little hit or miss, um, even though I, I think that his uh, personality is pretty engaging. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that sounds like a, a one to definitely check out. Um, so we often, uh, for regular viewers, we talk about some pretty spicy, kind of uh, titillating stuff. Um, Boy, so hit me, hit me with it. Yeah, so I'm gonna. There's actually a little bit of of. Um, so I don't know how, like, but I'm just gonna cover this part. Um, it is a quiet day in. Um, Cleesey, I think I'm saying that right, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this is one that was weirdly not on my radar, but um, it is based on a um, novel from Henry Miller, um, who I think you either kind of love or you, or you hate. Um, and this is a very bold film that really is just in your face with sex and sexuality and this is very much a pro a product of its time um and yeah if you were like easily offended by things like certain words i, I don't want to get too graphic for y'all but like yeah it, it it's just they they go for it but but let me uh before i get too into this let me just show you um um, this uh, alternate covers um, I can actually show you it's not really um, I mean it is very sexy though I mean it it, it <laughs> is a really fantastic cover art so here's the discs and the back and uh, as you can see like this release is stacked I mean I am never disappointed when it comes to Blue Underground and like all the um, features they provide and it looks fantastic, but I'll get into that um, a little bit more uh, after I've been talking about the film. But um, it kind of, this is a movie, you've seen this, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a movie, and and let me know if you agree that within the first few minutes, you kind of know what you're getting, right? Like it, it you know, it is very in your face. Um, 
it is very weird. <laughs> um, it, it, it uh, in my notes, I put down. It kind of reminded me of like Jim Jarmusch meets John Waters. I um, I think that's a pretty good comparison, honestly. <laughs> yeah, like because it it has that like almost undefiable air of cool and like chic that Jarmusch was is wasn't is known for, but then it has this outrageous sex that like I could definitely see like John Waters like just reveling in. Mm -hmm. So um and I was actually kind of surprised that like it is hardcore. Like there are like scenes that are like full penetration. So like I'm assuming a lot of our audience isn't offended by that. But if you are, you might not watch like this movie. <laughs> but um yeah, it's not a family film. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't you think you can barely did. show the cover art. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, it's kind of interesting because, um, the director does play around with this documentary like style, but then it bucks up against what I think is a little bit more experimental and hyper stylized. Um, but the whole thing is really engaging and intoxicating. Like, there's this again, undefinable sort of like air of like chic sophistication meets this sort of grungy grimy it almost reminded me of like Paul Morsery's sort of early films like his um like trilogy with Joe Dallas D'Alessandro um Heat Flesh and Trash it kind of gave me a little bit of that vibes uh as well so if you like any of those references um or you think that you might like this definitely will be something that um you will probably jive with it's um really uh it's got um some pretty legendary um jazz players um that also just kind of fuels this um really hip uh interesting kind of um like vibe that it's putting off um so uh this is black and white and uh it looks beautiful in 4k i've never seen this in any other medium but I was just kind of blown away by how crystal clean and clear it looks. Um, the contrasting is really nice. Um, especially I've seen a lot of like um like early um 70s like art house films where even in restorations they don't look great. Mm -hmm. Um, like there's a lot of like wear and tear, um, a lot of artifacts. This is not the case uh with this film. It is beautiful. Whoever had these um you know, whatever camera negatives they were using were taken care of extremely well because um, outside of maybe like a little bit of like um, just artifacts here and there, it, it really just looks pristine. I, I had no issues with it uh, whatsoever. Again, with a lot of these like older films that are black and white, I like how we were to a point where we can just have it really nicely contrasted where it's not like completely blown out, but it's also like not dark. And this is a very vibrant looking film, even though it is in black and white, but it's very, I mean, it fits that, that um, vibe of being very boisterous and very like alive. And you get that in the cinematography and this transfer really celebrates that. So um, yeah. Um, this uh, again has a wealth of extras. Um, it is fantastic. It really helped me sort of learn more about this film. Um, I spent all um, today just pouring through after I watched the movie yesterday. I got to really deep dive into this, like with all the extras. And it does make repeat viewings, I think, more. Um, interesting and engaging because it gives you a lot of context behind the, the film which I mean uh, that's another thing that Blue Underground is awesome at it, it will give you a lot of great features that will help you appreciate the film more on repeat viewing so I liked it I like I think I like it more now that I have some of that background information so re-watching it I think is going to be a lot of fun so uh yeah it's it's a wild time what, what did you think i i i'm very interested to hear what you think of it 
Yeah, I think it's a really intriguing movie. I, I will just say, based on what you were saying, that it is definitely not a self-conscious movie. It's very uh, forthright in what it's trying to accomplish, and it doesn't really shy away from anything it's trying to do. Um, I, I'm mostly, like, I was mostly engaged by the narrative. I didn't really, uh, some of the things, like, I think just on a narrative wavelength some of the things were a little maybe extended to like my like it could have been shortened a little bit but overall i it's it's an interesting movie like it's definitely one that i like you said i think it'll reward repeat viewings as i get more from it just like learning about this like this guy and like his whole situation and it like I said, it's a it's a steamy time <laughs> yeah and it's interesting because i was reading some reviews and everybody was not everybody, but there was a few people saying it was like boring or not like not very engaging. And I'm like, I think we watched two different movies because, I mean, again, you know, the pacing might have a little bit of issues, but it's just one of those like mood pieces where I just kind of like let the movie just sort of take me where it wants to go. And sometimes that's not always a neat, you know, structured three act sort of story. And I think maybe if you're not used to something that's maybe not as like rigid, rigidly structured, you might, I mean, someone might find this a little bit daunting, but I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's one of my um, like favorite recent discoveries even. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. uh, that's high praise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I just love how like it, you're exactly right. It is not self-conscious. It It is, a wildly scummy celebration of the flesh and who can't use that every once in a while right yeah <laughs> if, if, if you're if the mood strikes you <laughs> <laughs> uh this is like a total like 180 from what we were just talking <laughs> about uh my final title is from kino classics and that is Bedtime for Bonzo mm. <laughs> uh, with Ronald Reagan and Diana Lynn. Um, and I will just say, I think this movie would have been like, this feels like a movie that Jimmy Stewart like passed up, but it, he would have, his presence would have made the movie a lot better. Uh, like 1951, it would have been like, I know he's, doing better things but still this seems like the type of movie that he would have like thrived in in his earlier years um so despite uh i i, I know we've talked uh, a little bit offline <laughs> about uh reagan and uh him being a uh, uh, a demon incarnate or whatever <laughs> uh but that aside <laughs> um this movie it features a chip okay that's <laughs> review done okay like that's all you know um it's it's cute it's fun um this feels uh like it feels like a movie that i would have discovered from the warner archive of it mm -hmm. on uh weirdly um but i enjoyed this for the most part it's there's some definite issues i will say that even aside from reagan um but um there's just like a like a wholesome charm to it that I was mostly won over by and I kind of could put myself in that kind of like early 1950s mindset of how they are viewing different like gender norms and all that type of stuff. Um, so Ronald Reagan plays a scientist at a university. He is kind of uh, studying uh, human behavior and he is uh, wants to get engaged to the daughter of I think either the dean or like the head of his department one of those type of things the problem is he his father was a criminal and um he uh he's afraid that the dean will or the dean is uncertain about whether like he has like his genes basically predispose him to being like a bad egg for his daughter so reagan his character he um comes up with this idea like to in private kind of uh fully um conducted this experiment on nature versus nurture and then there's this um chimpanzee named bonzo which which is within the department so he 
takes that chimp and he goes and he like tries to take it home and in private teach him the differences between right and wrong. Um, and in order to do this, in order to help him with this, he hires uh, like uh, a basically a nursemaid to come in and kind of take care of him while he's like having to teach class and everything, which happens to be uh, Diana Lynn's character um, right here. here. Um, so um, he expects like an older matronly lady who's taken uh, care of a bunch of kids throughout her life, but it ha happens to be this young woman who's taken care of like all of her brothers and sisters and raised them. And so there's the, the, the shenanigans with the monkey. There's this uh, like blooming unexpected romance between him and this young caretaker who um, she is like, she, uh, like she is unbeknownst to him, just basically like everything that he didn't know he needed. Like, and he's like, he's not really meant for this other lady that he wants to be engaged to. So there's like a story of them kind of like, unexpected romance then monkey shenanigans and then like kind of prat balls and all that type of stuff so there are some whenever they're establishing their places within the household like you're going to be the mama of this uh like chimp and i'm going to be the papa and stuff and like how they interact with one another there's like some very antiquated notions of like what a mama should be and how she should relate to the like the patriarch of the family and all that stuff so that's kind of gross but it is the early 1950s so i like i'll, I'll set it aside um but other than that i think it's a pretty enjoyable like screw like screwball pratball comedy with a chimp and raising it and like light romance and uh so i enjoyed it it was fun it was like it was nice there was like after like the Valachi papers where you have like mafia people killing <laughs> like people all the time, it was just fun to see a mon monkey just like screw around and all that. So I, I'm easily entertained. Um, it had a monkey and also um, uh, one of the worst presidents in history. <laughs> it has it all. It has it all. <laughs> Um, this new uh, Blu-ray from Kino comes from a new 2K Master, and while there's still like some lines and specs and stuff here and there, it looks really nice. I really uh, like the look of this film. It sounds pretty nice, and there is an audio commentary from Eddie Bon Mueller. <laughs> um, I know we've had this <laughs> yeah. mistake in the past, <laughs> um, but so it's like like there is a commentary so that's good and it looks pretty and looks and sounds pretty good so if you have interest in this film it's a good presentation if you have a, like a hatred against reagan there's no reason to pick this up but it's a it's a fine movie it's just a lighthearted little rock yeah and i i will say that i love what kino puts out so <laughs> Uh, if you are sort of a completist and that's your thing, that's awesome. Like I'm, I'm very happy for people that are excited for this movie. Um, yeah. If you're a Kino completist, I don't understand how you're not in the poor house. They release so <laughs> many things. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. They, um, every sale um, that they have, I'm just like, Oh, you know, just take it all, take it all. Just... Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, that sounds interesting. Um, so my next one, my final one um, is the Universal 4K set. Um, and um, I know we talked about um, the volume one and then this is similar as it's a Digibook. Um, and I can uh, flip here and um i'm not a big fan of these like slide out um things but they are what you have to work with so um yeah so um i will go through these movies really quickly they're all like really famous so um it, it's not like people don't know these movies but uh, Bride of Frankenstein is definitely, I think, the crown jewel in this set. Um, it's one of the, uh, I think, the best um, universal horror movie, um, full stop, um, especially from this, like, era, which was, like, the first wave of um, universal um, monster movies. Um, 
So uh, yeah, this uh, is fantastic. It has a whale stamp all over it. Um, you know, it has his um, wry, sardonic uh, sense of humor. Um, I will say that, like, it's nice that Frankenstein is is definitely uh, a more serious movie that is a little bit tongue in cheek. But here, he really is allowed to sort of just go whole ham. Um, that being said, that there are some really touching scenes, like the scenes between um, Frankenstein's monster and the hermit, for example, is maybe some of the most touching moments um, in all of the Universal horror movies. Um, so, um, you know, again, uh, the 4K looks great. Um, so kind of like I said in the first volume, um, the legacy collection on DVD um, was a little bit disappointing because it, it's the prints were very spotty, but um, like you see with that volume one, they really do uh, do a good job of doing a new, what looks like a new restoration. Um, I can say that in this set with confidence, because I've seen these many times before uh on the old legacy um dvds um and then like later on in the blu-rays um like is there a vast difference between the blu-ray and the 4k i i mean i think things just look a little bit nicer and sharper um but uh i think it is i, I if you only ever really had the legacy um collection like this is a must i mean there's no doubt about it there it, it's like leaps and bounds better i mean there's a still a little bit of artifacts um but it's a huge step up um you know like it's relatively newer than like frankenstein um so you do see that like quality a little bit more like just in, just overall in the picture and the audio um but yeah, it, it's really fantastic. The Mummy was directed as uh, the next one and is directed by the famed DP Carl Freund. And uh, it's another horror outing starring Boris Karloff. Um, in my opinion, The Mummy has some good moments, but I think it really doesn't come together in terms of um, the plot. Um, also, I never really like... like Bride of Frankenstein has some good humor, but it never feels forced when a lot of humor in this movie feels a little uh, forced. Um, but having said that, visually, it's a great film and Karloft is fantastic. Um, you have the makeup artist Jack Pierce. Once again, that is a winning combination. Like the look of Karloff's um, mummy is just still really stunning. Um, again, this uh, this movie looks great. It doesn't look maybe as good as Bride of Frankenstein because it's just not as like it's a little older, but still um, there's not a lot of artifacts. Um, there's not a lot of like scratches. Um, I actually got to see this um, print up on the big screen, um, which really looked fantastic. So like that's another mark of a good restoration if you can like project it. And it still looks really clean and crisp and, and just nice. Um, Creature from the Black Lagoon is the next film. This is a movie that uh, is not my favorite, but but I think it is like hands down one of the best creature features from the 50s. Um, and it was so cool because um, early in my like convention going days, I got to meet... Um, like Julie Adams and Ben Chapman, who plays the the walk of the one the creatures like above land or above water, like walking around. It's Ben Chapman, and then uh, Rico Browning is the um, stunt man that would do all the underwater stuff when the creatures swimming. So I got to meet all three of them. Um, I got to meet like Julie a few times, and just super nice, but. Yeah, it's one of those movies that uh, you can really tell that it had a huge influence on people like Spielberg. Like there's some shots that you can see from like above water where um, like, you know, uh, like there's a scene of like Julie swimming. 
that sort of is echoed a little bit at the beginning of Jaws um, with the first victim. And I think Spielberg has been been pretty forthright by saying that, like, obviously Jaws and, and Creature from the Black Lagoon are very different movies, but it, it definitely inspired him to um, make a film like Jaws. So, you know, um, again, it's it's not stellar. There are some like um, shaggy plot elements. Um, but uh, yeah, I overall really liked it. Um, it's one of those movies that it has a ecological message, but it doesn't like bludgeon you over the head with it. So it's a good time. And again, um, this is this and Phantom are probably the best looking out of this set. Um, again, this is like a newer film from the 50s. So presumably the like film, the film stock has had been a little bit newer, um, a little probably taken better care of. And uh, it is probably the most pristine I've ever seen this movie, like full stop. Even the Blu-ray, I think this is a marked improvement. Um, so it is really the, the, the clearest I've ever seen. Um, again, with a lot of these black and white films, um, like the contrast in black and white's really nice. Um, like audios, um, again, I think a, a marked improvement over the Blu-ray as well. So my next one is probably probably my least favorite, and that is the remake of um, The Phantom of the Opera. And this is not to be confused with the really famous Lon Chaney Sr. Um, version of the film. Um, this is a big budget color remake, and um, this is the only color film in this set. Um, so honestly, I think even hardcore Universal Monster fans uh, kind of have to admit this is maybe one of the weaker entries in the, the classic lineup. Um, I think the issue is, unlike the silent film, the Phantom is is this time around given like an origin story. And it, it almost, it's so frustrating because it like demystifies his character. And I don't, I think that that kind of takes away from like, like the whole horror and, and aura that um, Cheney's uh, Phantom had. So, um, I mean, it is, um, the production values are much better. Um, you know, they really do use the color photography to its utmost perfection. But I think the pacing is also kind of wonky. Uh, if you don't like opera, you will not like this film because they just film like full opera sequences. And that's fine if you dig that, but it, it's, a, it's a little jarring. And it really, I think, kind of like keeps the, the plot from really clipping along. Um, and they do things that are really kind of weird, like the famous chandelier scene is almost towards the end of the film instead of at like the beginning slash middle-ish. Um, so um, having said that, um, even though I didn't really connect with that film all that much, it looks really great. It just, um, it, it's one of those like color films where like it's the restoration is so good that you can see like details of um like costumes and like textures of the costumes and it, it's just it is a visually vibrant movie and like colors really pop here it's it's not like some of like like the early color films where there's like a weird like reddish tint to people's faces like there it, it just has a really nice natural look it it is a little bit soft at times, but I chalk that up to maybe how it was photographed, not necessarily a problem with the restoration. So overall, it's a really nice set. Um, you know, it's a nice companion piece to volume one. And I think that it's worth uh, checking out. And uh, I think that's kind of a good high note to and this uh, this rather a uh, little bit long but very eclectic kind of um, uh, video addict. So um, as always, definitely consider giving this video a like, uh, subscribe. Uh, we're not doing a comment giveaway thing, but we always appreciate you letting us know, um, you know, what uh, you like that we covered and um, what 
maybe we didn't cover that should be on our radar. So mm -hmm. uh, as always, thanks for hanging out with us.